Craig Hill, Odd Outlet, A Strange Set of Experiments. I still have a minute before we get started, but if you haven't done it... I'd just like to say a few words before we get started. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, actually, I would like to say a few words. Greg is giving a lecture, um, but and he will talk about some of the work around the room, but he probably won't talk about all of it. And I would urge all of you to find an extra hour in your schedule. I know that's an impossible task. Um, and spend it in here and really take in what he has done because it's absolutely amazing and it takes a little while to um, really appreciate that. And don't miss the audio um, piece in the back. There are headphones to put on, you can listen to, and also the um, video piece in the South Gallery. And if you go into any of the bathrooms, um, you might notice art around the mirrors. That is also part of the great work. So, um, just know an invitation to uh, see what he has done. Thanks. So again, um, if you're interested, hand out in the back. And if you're motivated to read the directions and see what you can come up with, that would be great. If you haven't already finished, 
is to write a poem using only those words from the columns in the list. You don't have to use all the words. You may repeat words from the list. And as you can see, some words have list on the list have parentheses, like around the S at the end of the word, which means you can use a singular or the plural form, whatever you see. Okay, let's start. But first, here's a problem. I don't know what I'm talking about. This lecture is partially about conceptual poetry, a topic that is so new that unless you went to Drew Swenhaugen's excellent lecture last summer on conceptual poetry, or Gail's yesterday, you're excused for knowing nothing about conceptual poetry, which puts you in good company with me, or at least the person I was two years ago when I started this program when I arrived eager to work on improving my craft. But what happened here and at home and in the four-hour car rides in between here and home, was that I was slowly that I slowly came to realize that while I was working on my own creative writing, I was also learning that some strange experiments I had been giving myself were more than writing exercises, that the reasons I thought of them as not poetry are exactly the reasons why they just might be. That's what Kenneth Goldsmith calls uncreative writing. He's the first name you should know in conceptual poetry. He's not the earliest name, but when critics of conceptual poetry argue against the genre as a mere cult of personality, it's Kenny Goldsmith's personality that critics target first. One notion of the uncreative writing that occupies large corners of conceptual poetry is that its success lies in removing the author from the poem, removing the ego removing the poet, which I kind of like because by removing the poet from the act of writing poetry, I can write poems without the labor of writing poems. And I can't take it personally when I receive a rejection letter because, hey, the poem I wrote wasn't even written by me. Though, ironically, as Goldsmith points out, and as I myself realize, taking the poet out is actually a perfect way of putting the poet into the poem. In a way, there's more of me and some of my uncreative poems than my creative or lyric poems. And uncreative writing can be very hard to do because, or it can be very hard to do, and it can be very creative. If you're confused, you're in good company. You're right here with me. To give an excellent lecture, I want to talk about great things that are happening in conceptual poetry. I certainly want to avoid talking about myself. But I'm going to talk about myself, too. So please stay if you can bear it, even though, as I said, I don't know what I'm talking about. Also, I don't know what I'm talking about because conceptual poetry, among the newest of nascent poetry movements, both eschews categorization and has defined subgroups, some of which take a degree in art history to explain them. Well. As you can see from the posters, I don't have a major in art history. But I do promise you'll learn something today. I'm going to give a broad strokes overview of conceptual poetry, some history, some important players but I'm also going to talk about my own discoveries and some of my own forays. In the creation of a conceptual poem, the creativity comes at the beginning. In fact, in principle, the creative part of a conceptual poem comes entirely before any word is written down. Once the plan for the poem is set in place, the actual writing, the putting of words on paper, has no creativity. Just as your computer's printer isn't creatively writing your poem when you're printing it out, it's just following directions. In his conceptual art treatise, Paragraphs on Conceptual Art, Saul LeWitt explains conceptual visual art this way. In conceptual art, the idea or concept is the most important aspect of the work. When an artist uses a conceptual form of art, it means that all of the planning and decisions are made beforehand and the execution is a perfunctory affair. The idea becomes a machine that makes the art. Kenneth Goldsmith, coming after, writes this in his Paragraphs on Conceptual Poetry. Look familiar? Goldsmith reasons, why reinvent the wheel? Why start from scratch when a great mind has already said what Goldsmith wants to say? You might, you might call this quote plagiarism or misappropriation. But isn't quoting a nod in deference to great minds? Isn't that what I just did by quoting Saul Lewitt? 
the first example of conceptual writing, in which I was told it was conceptual writing, was a thin book that Jen Bourbon mailed to me in 2012 called The Sun Also Also Rises by Robert Fitterman. I didn't get it at first, and I didn't love it. After flipping through it, I did realize Fitterman had recopied Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, but he had deleted all sentences except those that began with the pronoun I. Fitterman took the master of the short sentence and shortened his book. You don't need to read this quote from the book, just see that every sentence is an I statement. To be clear, this is different than plagiarism, at least because what Fitterman was doing was obvious. He talked about how he decided on the source text and the discoveries that came from the process. And two things are important to note here. One, Fitterman's work can be grouped into the subgenre of conceptual poetry called erasure. And it turns out there are myriad examples of erasure. A good place to jump right in is Mary Ruffel's A Little White Shadow and Jen Bourbon's Nets, both of which, I hope, are still for sale at the bookstore. And two, the key to conceptual work is the focus on and importance of concept and process as opposed to product. This is the paradigm shift of conceptual art, by which I mean conceptual writing and conceptual visual art. Anyone recognize this building in this photo? Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. It's the Guggenheim in Bilbao, Spain. Do you know who designed it? Frank Gehry. That's right. This building is a Frank Gehry. We call it a Frank Gehry building. But he didn't build it at all. At all. It was his idea, his design. His creativity came at the beginning, before the construction, before it became a product. But once his plans were drawn up and blueprints were printed out, it was up to other people who weren't necessarily creative, really, or in the same way, who were just following his directions, his blueprint. Saul Lewitt's paintings are another example of conceptual visual art for which the creativity is manifest entirely in the concept phase and the execution of the painting is so perfunctory as to be assigned to someone else. Here's a set of instructions by Saul Lewitt. This, re this represents his contribution to the work. And here is a photograph of a 2009 installation in Virginia. The work is a Saul Lewitt Never mind that he died in 2007. Key to conceptual art is that the execution of the concept into a physical artifact does not even need to be made by the artist. That can be executed by anyone. This is true even if different executions of the same directions produce different results. Robert Fitterman came up with the idea to take the sun also rises and erase every sentence that didn't begin with a first-person pronoun. But whether he went through the book and erased each of those sentences, or whether he paid someone else to do it for him, is, in reality, irrelevant. Cutting out sentences is not creative. Given the right program, a computer should be able to do it in zero seconds. The creativity lies in the idea, or also in the computer program. Here are a few big names in the conceptual poetry world. Start with Kenneth Goldsmith, Vanessa Place, Christian Book, and Marjorie Perloff. You can come back to these slides at the end if you like. I'll talk about a few of these poets, but not all. This book, Against Expression, is a great anthology of conceptual writing. It's edited by Craig Dorgan and Kenny Goldsmith. I had the opportunity to meet Kenneth Goldsmith a few times in the Museum of Modern Art when he was there, when he was their own first poet laureate of the MoMA. All of his work is appropriation, and by that I basically mean it's plagiarized. Day is a rewriting word for word of the September 1, 2000 issue of the New York Times. Traffic <laughs> is transcriptions of New York City traffic reports every 10 minutes over a 24 hour period. Sports is a word-for-word -word transcription of the longest nine-inning baseball game in history, a Red Sox-Yankees game that lasted, I think, over five hours. It includes every ad break, every esoteric statistic and observation to fill in airtime, every meaningless comment by Susan Walden. Susan it's completely boring, 
and that is elemental to its genius. Kenneth Goldsmith is crazy. <laughs> this is what he wore when he met President Obama. <laughs> A tremendously gaudy suit with giant oversized paisleys. But it was intentionally the same brand of suit, I think Brooks Brothers, that Obama wore. So it was a statement about universality, about the purpose of poets to investigate the small and the minutia, like Paisley's, and blow them up, give prominence to the obscure. Oh, how clever, Kenny. <laughs> Goldsmith justifies his plagiarism in part as an act against the sheer volume of poetry that is created today. In 1969, the conceptualist artist Douglas Huber, Hubler wrote, the world is full of objects, more or less interesting. I do not wish to add any more. I've come to embrace Hubler's idea, though it might be retooled as, the world is full of texts, more or less interesting. I do not wish to add any more. It seems an appropriate response to a new condition in writing. With an unprecedented amount of available text, our problem is not needing to write more of it. Instead, we must learn to negotiate the vast quantity that exists. How I make my way through this thicket of information, how I manage it, parse it, organize it, and distribute it, is what distinguishes my writing from yours. The prominent literary critic Marjorie Perloff has begun using the term unoriginal genius to describe this tendency emerging in literature. Her idea is that because of changes brought on by technology and the internet, our notion of the genius, a romantic isolated figure, is outdated. An updated notion of genius would have to center around one's mastery of information and its dissemination. Perlap has coined another term, moving information, to signify both the act of pushing language around as well as the act of being emotionally moved by that process. She posits that today's writer resembles more a programmer than a tortured genius, brilliantly conceptualizing, constructing, executing, and maintaining a writing machine. Perloff's notion of unoriginal genius should not be seen merely as a theoretical conceit, but rather as a realized writing practice, one that dates back to the early part of the 20th century, embodying an ethos in which the construction or conception of a text is as important as what the text says or does. Today, technology has exacerbated these mechanistic tendencies in writing, inciting younger writers to take their cues from the workings of technology and the web as ways of constructing literature. As a result, Writers are exploring ways of writing that have been thought traditionally to be outside the scope of literary practice. Word processing, databasing, recycling, appropriation, intentional plagiarism, identity ciphering, and intensive programming, to name just a few. In 2007, Jonathan Lethem published a pro-plagiarism, plagiarized essay in Harper's titled The Ecstasy of Influence, a plagiarism. It's a lengthy defense and history of how ideas in literature have been shared, riffed, culled, reused, recycled, swiped, stolen, quoted, lifted, duplicated, gifted, appropriated, mimicked, and pirated for as long as literature has existed. Let them reminds us of how gift economies, open source cultures, and public commons have been vital for the creation of new works, with themes from older works forming the basis for new ones. Echoing the cries of free culture advocates such as Lawrence Lessig and Cory Doctorow, he eloquently rails against copyright law as a threat to the lifeblood of creativity. From Martin Luther King Jr.'s sermons to Muddy Waters' blue tunes, he showcases the rich fruits of shared culture. He even <laughs> cites examples of what he had assumed were his own original thoughts, only later to realize, usually by Googling, that he had unconsciously absorbed someone else's ideas that he then claimed as his own. It's a great essay, too bad he didn't write it. <laughs> Nearly every word and idea was borrowed from somewhere else, either appropriated in its entirety or rewritten by Lethem. His essay is an example of patch writing, a way of weaving together various shards of other people's words into a tonally cohesive whole. It's a trick that students use all the time, rephrasing, say, a Wikipedia entry, entry into their own words. And if they're caught, it's trouble. In academia, 
patch writing is considered an offense equal to that of plagiarism. If Lethem had submitted this as a senior thesis or dissertation chapter, he'd be shown the door. Yet few would argue that he didn't construct a brilliant work of art, as well as writing a pointed essay, entirely in the words of others. It's the way in which he conceptualized and executed his writing machine, surgically choosing what to borrow, arranging those words in a skillful way, that wins us over. Lethem's piece is a self-reflexive, demonstrative work of unoriginal genius. Far from this uncreative literature being a nihilistic, begrudging acceptance, or even an outright rejection of a presumed technological enslavement, it is a writing imbued with celebration, ablaze with enthusiasm for the future, embracing this moment as one pregnant with possibility. Writers function more like programmers than traditional writers, taking Solowitz's dictum to heart. When an artist uses a conceptual form of art, it means that all of the planning and decisions are made beforehand, and the execution is a perfunctory affair. The idea becomes a machine that makes the art, and raising new possibilities of what writing can be. The poet Craig Dworkin posits, what would a non-expressive poetry look like? A poetry of intellect rather than emotion." one in which the substitutions at the heart of metaphor and image were replaced by the direct presentation of language itself, with spontaneous overflow supplanted by meticulous procedure and exhaustively logical process, in which the self-regard of the poet's ego were turned back onto the self-reflexive language of the poem itself. So that the test of poetry were no longer whether it could have been done better, the question of the workshop, but whether it could conceivably have been done otherwise. There's been an explosion of writers employing strategies of copying and appropriation over the past few years, with a computer encouraging writers to mimic its workings. When cutting and pasting are integral to the writing process, it would be mad to imagine that writers wouldn't exploit these functions in extreme ways that weren't intended by their creators. We find several precedents for such gestures. While home computers have been around for about two decades and people have been cutting and pasting all that time, it's the sheer penetration and saturation that makes the harvesting of masses of language easy and tempting. By comparison, there was nothing native to typewriting that encouraged the replication of texts. It was slow and laborious to do so. Later, after you had finished writing, you could make all the copies you wanted on the Xerox machine. As a result, there was a tremendous amount of 20th century post-writing print-based detour mark. The previous forms of borrowing in literature, collage and pastiche, taking a word from here, a sentence from there, were developed based on the amount of labor involved. Having to manually retype or hand copy an entire book on a typewriter is one thing. Cutting and pasting an entire book with three keystrokes, select all, copy, paste, is another. Thanks, I, I have a little more to go. But. <laughs> How are you guys coming along in the poems? In a couple minutes, I'm going to ask for some volunteers. So if you're thinking of wrapping it up, you can wrap it up. OK. I'm going to go fairly quickly through various types of poetry that are in some way conceptual. We don't have time to go all the way through, so I'm going to probably hit uh, two or three of these. And uh, that may be it. Uh, the first is erasure, which, after everything I just said, may be only tangentially conceptual in that the writing proceeds not from a set of rigid instructions, but from a rigid source text. I've seen, erasure, I've seen erasures made from the 9-11 Commission report, a Victorian novel, Paradise Lost, and Shakespeare's sonnets. Here's an image from A Little White Shadow by Mary Ruffell. And here are some others. I'm not sure where they're all from. I like this one from a page. It looks like the title is Online, the Emmy Awards. Uh, the poet created, Marriage is two people in love standing in the same bathroom. I made this one quickly for Lee Thomas, who graduated last winter. This is a page from one of his recent novels, Ash Street. To compose an erasure, 
take a source text and boil off some percentage of the text until you reduce it to a new text that may be so reduced that it says something entirely new. In the case of Robert Fitterman, his work was purely conceptual by Kenneth Goldsmith's definition. But because there is a notion of concept in any erasure, I would argue that erasures are close to, if not full-blooded, conceptual art. I have several homemade chapbooks on display here in the back, some of which are conceptual, and again, some of these around uh, the room. Uh, I can answer questions about these at the end if you like, um, and uh, talk about the conceptual nature of some of these poems. Uh, but I will say that the chapbook Alice, for example, a section of which I read yesterday, is an erasure of Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. I followed a strict mathematical formula. I erased all words except for the words whose letter length equals chapter number. So chapter one is reduced to a bunch of A's and I's and makes absolutely no sense. The word Alice only appears in chapter five because it's five letters long. And by the way, um, Jen Bourbon um, calls herself not an erasure poet, but what is the term? Oh, she had a term yesterday for it. What, she prefers to augment rather than be seen as uh, taking away. So she's a restorative poet? Restorative poet. The fact that I followed such a strict mathematical rule makes the poem not only an erasure, but I think part of a movement called Ulipo. The word Ulipo is a French acronym which in English stands for Workshop of Potential Literature. Founded by mathematicians in 1960, the thrust of Ulipo is the use of constrained writing techniques to produce new literature that is fundamentally conceptual and that the process is favored over the product. I love this book, The Ulipo Compendium edited by Harry Matthews and Alistair Ro Rochi. It's a comprehensive resource and a trove of inspirational ideas. I, I recommend it highly. Ulipo Compendium. I have another chapbook over in the northeast, or back left corner of the gallery, called War, which I think is also Ulipo, and certainly conceptual, in that it is entirely mathematically structured, and it is, as Kenneth Goldsmith prides himself about his own works, technically readable, but in practicality, totally unreadable. Okay, uh, that brings us to your assignment. Um, has anyone made any progress? Has anyone uh, completed a poem in the words on the page that they would like to volunteer to read for the rest of the class? Chase, come on up, please. Chase Mack, everyone. Tree tufts, fag, dad, I tread bigger, huts, a dead, deft hug, I <laughs> fade, tug, <laughs> bad, blah, odd, once I bade by, do, huh? Once. Anyone else care to volunteer? Cut. Cut. This is a haiku sequence of increasing conceptualism. A daft gaffer dead by noon ponders jihad. Cafe decaf huffs faded BAFTA feed. Thank you. <laughs> so, small list of words, but totally different poems. And if you look at your own, you may notice that it resembles nothing of what um, you just heard. Thank you, Colleague. Thank you, Jack, Jack Chase. All right, so I'm going to explain what I did here. Um, I started by making a little spiral um, using integer points. You can do this on an Excel spreadsheet. And starting in the middle and working outwards, I decided to start with a diagonal 
up and to the right, but I could have as easily gone straight to the right or to the left. Then I superimposed over that coil the alphabet. <clears throat> and then from there, I played boggle with myself. <laughs> I came up with all the words I could find uh, that fit. And so hopefully, if I've done this right, um, the words that you see in the list all qualify. Now, I did give myself uh, the option of repeating a letter, which Boggle frowns on, or returning to the same letter. So um, you can see I can do big B-I-G or B-I-G-G-E-R. You can see all the letters are either adjacent or diagonal from each other. And that was the limit. There may be many, many more words, but I didn't. I stopped when I found enough words that I thought would qualify. So the poems that you've created have been generated from this process. Um, I saw it as a three-step process. One was creating the spiral, which was perfunctory. Then constraint. And using the words from the list, I created a constrained poem, and so did you. You couldn't use all the words available to you. You were limited by the words that I provided for you. From there, I decided to branch out from uh, the conceptual notion and then take that constrained poem and write what I considered a translation from English, your poem was in English, to English, where I used any words that I wanted. So this is a draft that I came up with, and you can see that I've uh, inserted extra elements. I decided to change in the last line, refer to a cigar. It's close enough for me. Um, I added the size of the boot, um, a size 12 work boot, something that I could not have done using just the limited words. And then I repeated the process with different spirals. You get a different spiral if you if B is not diagonal, if B is straight above or to the side of A, and then go that way. Okay. Also, in line with Goldsmith and Solowitz's definitions of conceptual work are found poems, another subgenre of conceptual poetry for which the text is not initially created to be a poem, but someone, usually not the author, appropriates it as is, as a poem. Of literary authorship, Goldsmith writes... I'm not so sure that, as writers, we'll still have careers in the same way we used to. Literary works might function the same way that memes do today on the web, spreading for a short period, often unsigned and unauthored, only to be supplanted by the next ripple. While the author won't die, we might begin to view authorship in a more conceptual way. Perhaps the best authors of the future will be ones who can write the best programs with which to manipulate, parse, and distribute language-based practices. He's not entirely right. Literature isn't going to disappear. But, they, but there do seem to be more ways of communicating, more ways of creating writing as opposed to literature. However, as the notion of canonical literature evolves, and it must somehow, eventually, perhaps in the way Goldsmith and Christian books suggest, we see currently many examples of poetic word manipulation that is manufactured either by a computer program alone or by the hybrid of computer software and a collection of data from so many individuals that it is less fair to call those individuals authors than to say there is no author, per se, at all. Take Google Poetics. <laughs> this website, designed by Samsa, Nuotio, and Reisa Omahemo from Helsinki, Finland, in October 2012, is a forum for collecting Google's autocomplete results from its search function. In their own words, quote, Google Poetics is born when Google autocomplete suggestions are viewed as poems. Close quote. Visitors to the website are encouraged to take screenshots of the automatic suggestions in their Google searches and submit them as full-fledged poems. These are three examples. The code writers at Google didn't intend for these to be poems. And in fact, even if they did, the outcomes are based on algorithms that incorporate all of Google's users. It begs the question of authorship. If I type in, my God, I'm, into a Google search and find this gem, my God, I'm a tomato, my God, I'm delicious, 
my God, I'm pregnant. I wonder who did it. <laughs> Am I the author of the poem? Who are the authors? It's not Nuotio and Omahemo. It's not even the code writers at Google who could not have foreseen the, these results specifically. Looking at it one way, the authors are all of us. Each of us who contributes to the outcomes in the search functions just by typing whatever we type into Google. Or to look at it from another way, the author is the individual who, typing in the beginnings of a search and sees the Google autocompletes, decides that the three or four lines in front of her is a poem. But at the same time, she didn't write the lines herself. She didn't put those lines in the order she found them. She may not have even thought of the search itself as the germ of a poem. There's an argument for any answer you could provide addressing authorship. And I think this is why now is the moment, not only for conceptual writing, but for conversations about authorship, ownership, copyrights, etc. Laws have a lot of catching up to do with this moment. Twitter is a brand new world for poetry, a treasure trove of found poems. Some handles in particular, which mine every existing public tweet for their own use. Take anagrammatron, which pairs tweets that are anagrams of each other. I told her I was scared. A sword sliced the air. Tears are my pillow tonight. All right, I'm going to try to sleep now. Or one of my favorites, pantometron, which appropriates tweets that have been written, probably accidentally, in iambic pentameter. <laughs> You need only take seven such pairings, line them up in the right rhyme scheme, and voila, you're a Shakespearean sonneteer. <laughs> Twitter is a great source of text because of its sheer volume, and it's a great resource for multimedia art installations, too. Artist Rachel Knoll implied, employed Twitter for an installation called Listen and Repeat. Of the project, she writes, social media is used to connect, but currently but concurrently serves as a disconnect from social life outside of the virtual world. In Listen and Repeat, a modified megaphone uses text-to-speech capabilities to recite tweets composed with the tag Nobody Listens from the social media website Twitter. Uh, the megaphone has been installed on a mountain in Washington State and dictates tweets to an audience of trees. Here's to the kids who'd never vent to anyone because nobody listens. Hate it when nobody listens to me yet I'm the one that's been there done that all that and I know best and I'm always right at the end. Nobody listens and nobody understands. Everybody talks but nobody listens. Nobody listens to me so I just don't talk. Anyway, you get the idea. Another website that combines user input with a computer program is Hipster Ipsum. Web page designers, when creating outlines or wireframes of their pages, often need to add placeholder text, paragraphs of words that do not need to mean anything but just need to fill the space. The most common traditional text is taken from a first century BC Latin text by Cicero and known as Lorem Ipsum because those are the first two words. The text is useful and not copyright protected and for reasons that don't need explaining, became the default source of text so web designers could show how text would fit into their pages. But web page designers got tired of seeing lorem ipsum over and over again, so some use lyrics from their favorite bands or repeat a common phrase, as with, now is the time for all good men to come to the end of their party, or the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. In 2013, the website Hipster Ipsum combined this idea of filler, also called greeking, with the web coding for generating random output from static source text, in this case a list of words, terms, and phrases the creators defined as hipster. The website creates unique stanzas of what I argue is definitively poetry, which neither makes cogent sense nor needs to, yet still resonates emotionally with the reader. Here's an example. Roof party, 90s twee bitters. Cosby sweater, selfies, disrupt meggings, Nutra gastropub. 
PBR, bespoke sartorial, <laughs> cliche meggings, blue bottle, plaid bitters, fashion, ax on weed, vinyl. Actually, cred wayfarers, pitchfork, umami, cliche, trust fund, pop up, scenesters, scenester bitters, deep, v. Williamsburg, Bushwick. Ugh, vice, high life, ethical. Small batch, tofu, skateboard, YOLO. Bon me, irony, meh, scenester. Next level, narwhal, neutra. Wes Anderson, sartorial, fap, narwhal. Skateboard, art party, hashtag, Kofi <laughs> I went to the site, asked it to produce one stanza in the hipster-centric style, and voila, text that is randomly generated, but strangely interesting, somewhat compelling, if not coherent, potentially hilarious, at least I think so, and undeniably hipster. Is it a tempting mockery of a subculture? Of course. Is it high art? Not exactly. But is it poetic? Sure. And that's sufficient. But who's the author? The code writer? I don't think so. Me? I don't think so. The universe? The question gets existential and phenomenological. But authorship aside, it's still poetry, even if it makes no sense. OK, we're flying through these subgenres. I think this is going to be the last one. Uh, these subgenres are large, overlapping circles in the Venn diagrams of conceptual poetry, anyway, so there is some overlap. But ergodic poetry implies that effort is required on the part of the reader to engage meaningfully with the text, something beyond eyes moving back and forth over lines. This is the kind of writing you can't replicate on a Kindle, generally. So its rise in popularity must be, in part, a response to the e-reader. Ergodic poetry demands some additional engagement, turning and or manipulating the physical page, or pages employing specific computer technology that allows for a reading experience you just can't get with ink and on paper. Uh, the picture on the left is, uh, in part of my French, called Cent Mille Millard de Poèmes, which translates, I think, to the 100,000 billion poems. And what uh, the author um, and Ulipo authors did was to take a four, the idea of a 14-line sonnet, and for every line, come up with 10 examples that that line could be. So in each case, the first line could be any of the first of 10 lines, and the second was 10 new lines. So in total, he wrote 140 lines. But you can combine them, 10 to the 14th power, hence the title, and come up with that many poems, something that he did fairly quickly, given how long it would take you to read the entire corpus. Uh, between page and screen is an augmented reality book of poems that can be read only by having the page interact with a computer's camera. The book itself has no words, but words pop up quite literally and as if by magic when the ciphers on the book's page are read by the computer's camera.
there's a video that's playing on repeat in the South Gallery. I made it as part of efforts to experiment with conceptualism and to push the definition of poetry, and especially the notion of appropriation for the sake of art, if you call it art, up to you. I think of the work as a sort of translation, a language of images that are not completely decipherable to any of us, but somehow make perfect sense in HTML or the language of the internet, but I'm not sure. Again, I told you I don't know what I'm talking about. And I think maybe it qualifies as ergodic because for you, the viewer, to have a sense of the author's my, of my intentions, if that matters, is to employ non-trivial effort in order to transverse the text, to quote a previous slide. It requires your having a working knowledge of the source text, Hamlet's to be or not to be soliloquy, and a knowledge of the source from which the images come, Google search, and the methodology, which is that I used direct replacement, word for word, of the soliloquy with the first image result of a Google search for that word. So, I typed in to, T-O, and in a Google image search, and that top left back to school crayons picture was the first image. So, to, and then B, or not, to, B. For the second to, and the second B, I used the second image results. Google does not operate identically for all users, so your own attempt at this exercise might yield images that I did not use. In a small way, even with this exercise, which in theory has no necessary connection to me personally, I didn't write the soliloquy, and I didn't create any of the images, still the product is influenced by the person that I am, or at the very least, the computer terminal I used to search for those images which reinforces Kenneth Goldsmith's conclusion that even in these odd exercises of conceptual experimentation, where ego is intentionally avoided, some flavor of the author remains. Uh, so I'm going to end there, except to remind you that if you have questions about the posters around the wall, and you have questions to ask, like, what the hell were you thinking? Why is this poetry? Um, and uh, I'll be happy to stick around and do a lot and explain it. And, but I do encourage you to at least take a look, not to see the whole thing, because it's on, on repeat in the last 15 minutes. But just see a couple slides and see what the concept is for the to be or not to be soliloquies. And with that, I'll end it and answer any questions you briefly have um, before we do a lot or dismiss. Victoria. Why is this poetry? Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll talk to you after class. <laughs> I, I mean, it's a, it's a complicated question. Like, at the very basic level, I'm using words and I'm con hopefully conveying a message to you or allowing you to get a message out of the art or work that I've created. So at a most fundamental basic level, it fits the minimum requirement of poetry. And I think it's uh, a good discipline for poets to try to push the limits of definitions. Um, and I think at least it's a good exercise. And if I decide to go back to writing haiku and sonnets and limericks after that, so be it. Yeah. Why do you think we um, are moving away, uh, away from personalization in art? And I don't mean just through poetry. My son's a, a conceptual sculptor. Mm -hmm. And this is really hot in that world also. I'm just curious to know your thoughts. I'm doing something that's hot. <laughs> why? So why are we moving away from personalization? Uh, so Kenneth Goldsmith's knee-jerk reaction is there's enough personal stuff out there, and there's so much volume of data to be mined that it's interesting to see what we can do when we mine that data and create something new. Um, also, the population is just large, and the information is so vast and so easily spread out that when something happens, an internet meme goes viral, we all see it, no matter where we live, no matter what country we're in, sometimes. So we're all feeding off of the same hose of information. So in, in some way, and uh, I forget which person I was citing before Hubler, maybe. Um, no matter what you, what original idea you think you've come up with, there's a chance it came up 
you know, somewhere else. Um, there's an example, the, the tall, thin uh, poem on this close wall over here. I, I thought I was so pr- I was so proud of myself for the, the way that I came up with uh, creating it, and I can go into detail later, but it, it's a little complicated. And I thought, well, no one has ever done this before. Like, I came up with this idea all on my own. And I, I do promise I wasn't influenced by a uh, Christian book, but he did come up with something exactly the same on a, on a smaller scale chronologically before. So I, didn't, I don't think I got it straight from him because I didn't know about him when I was starting to work on it. And I don't know where he got the idea from. Are we all getting it from the same information? Is it just there's so much information that we're starting to see things in different ways and we coincidentally came up with the idea? But the reality is, I would love to take credit for this brand new idea of a form of poetry, but I'm not sure I can because it's been done before. So that's maybe part of the answer. Jen and Beck. Neo-confessional post-conceptual. <laughs> yeah, I'm from the um, avant-garde poetry movement called the anti-neo-confessional post-conceptual. I, I don't know if you've heard of us, but there's a school of us. They're coming up now. So. Yeah, po- poetry is a response, and maybe this helps to answer Jeff's question. Poetry is a response, or art movements are a response to previous art movements. <coughs> So taking information that already exists because of whatever reasons we decide and and usurping them and and appropriating them for our own means is a response to whatever movements came before that suggested, oh, everyone needs to be uh, an imagist or everyone needs to be really personal. But then there's a response that'll come back and say, hey, we're being unkind to ourselves. We're being so computer-like that we've lost focus on our humanity, an argument that's perfectly valid. And so whatever the double, triple hyphen name that Jen came up with, is a response to that. But we have 15 years and something will respond to that. There's also the suggestion that you can agree with or not that um, being hyper, that employing hyper realism, which is to just take basically data, data mining and appropriate it and call it a poem, can be more real, whatever that means, but to affect the reader in a deeper way than a poem that's written lyrically by an author sitting in a dark desk at and I could come up with. Perhaps because the the real data that you would interact with would be closer to you than the flowery metaphors that another poet has come up with that might not directly relate to you. I don't think we've lost the idea. I mean this Kenneth Goldsmith says this is the future and all of you guys are, who are writing creatively are stuck in the last century. That's, that's not true, I promise. <laughs> but it is interesting to entertain his thought and to think about how that can work. And for me, I took the last year to kind of entertain that thought pretty deeply. Yeah. Um, did you ever really write limericks? <laughs> That's just sort of my joke question. Uh, I'm assuming not. I'm not allowed to recite them. <laughs> no, I think you're making light of them, but but which is fine. Yeah. But, um, I'm wondering when this started for you. Like you, meant, you just mentioned this past year, so I was curious how much of a departure this is for you, and, and uh, where it, where it maybe began. Um, is how much of a departure is this? Uh, it's it's a big departure. I mean, when I when I started writing poetry with any seriousness in high school, I decided to write as many sonnets as I could, like Shakespearean-style sonnets. 
which were not Shakespearean in quality, but I was going for quantity. So maybe the, <laughs> so maybe the concept of my focus on quantity rather than quality has something some germ about what happened here. But, um, but I did. I, I, and I also had read somewhere in a place that I now know is totally fictional, but I, back when I was 14, I had no idea that this piece of information was wrong. But I had misread or read some false piece of information that suggested that Shakespeare wrote all 154 of the sonnets that he published together in 1609, that they were all written in one year. That's, people now think it took a decade or more. So I thought, well, just as an exercise, and I like William Shakespeare, I'm going to write 155. And I did. And they're bad. But that's, the, I mean, that's what I was doing. You know, during English class, instead of paying attention, it's right, just writing sonnets. But that's a formal style. And then I, you know, got into other styles of writing. I, I'm sick of writing sonnets, so I, I don't really do that anymore. Um, but I have written the traditional lyric, like the what these authors that I've been citing call the, the old version of the genius locked in the woods and thinking to himself and coming up. You know, the William Wordsworth kind of walk in the woods and then recollection and write the poem that way. So, I, And I still do that. I'm not totally divorced from the old me, but I like this experiment. Yeah. yeah just to add to that, I was in Greg's first workshop semester and it, none of this was in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the stuff that I've had workshop um, is not this stuff at all. And when I was doing things, like I didn't want to submit war to workshop because if you're in my workshop group and you have to analyze whiskey, hotel, India, Sierra, Kilo, Echo, Yankee, Alpha, Lima, Papa, Hotel, Alpha, Romeo, Oscar, Mike, Echo, Oscar, you're going to kill me. <laughs> it's a waste of your time. I, so for the sanity of everyone else, I, when I was starting to experiment, I didn't include that in the workshop stuff. So. Yeah, Jen. So, so um, even though I'm uh, in a writing program, I'm sort of a math guy, as maybe you could tell. Um, and uh, in order to uh, keep track or keep sanity, um, I uh, th tell me if this is what I'm uh, if I'm answering your question, Jen, about the list of quantitative poems that I, I kept uh, an Excel spreadsheet of. Uh, poems that I had written on every day of the year and every year. So I started it in, like, you know, March 11, 1993, and kept 365 rows, followed by, you know, or 10 columns, or however long it was. And if I wrote a poem that day, I would put a 1. And if I wrote two poems that day, I would put a 2 in that cell. And then I could add up the number of poems I'd written. Now, I qualify a poem as something that I spent five minutes on, had a start and a finish, and I could put a date on it, and that's fine. These are not poems that are like carefully thought out and like publishable. It could be five lines, it could be something about a girlfriend or whatever. But just in that quantity of, like, again, a very minimalist definition of poetry, um, whatever I considered, I counted, and then I accumulated those numbers. So I don't know if, if the reason you're asking is um, so that I can embarrass myself in front of everybody and tell you that I'm consciously counting how many poems I write on a given day. It was also interesting to be able to see, oh, I, in the last five years, I've never written a poem on March 22nd, like, for what that's worth. <laughs> but I, I was expecting to see some sort of bell curve, like maybe I wrote a lot toward my birthday or toward the summer or like at the end of the year during school breaks. It didn't seem to um, parse out that way, but the data was also um, confounded by one day I would have nothing to do and write what I counted as 20 poems. That would vastly disrupt the data. But um, So, yeah. I keep, I, Jen, it's, it's hard for me to keep track of that. Um, so I have let that go in the last uh, year or so. But, um, but yeah, I, I was in the habit of recording things chronologically. Okay, we're, we're way over time, so I'm happy to keep answering questions, but I, I know people want to go to dinner, so um, if that's it.